challenges facing the healthcare IT leader. Um, and I'd like to call on the moderator for this panel. And um, his name is Leonard Slavet, the CIO for uh, Ingelheim. And uh, Peter Mills, Head of Systems, Systems Integration Sales at T-Systems. And uh, Dr. Anton Prinsloo again. I'd also like to call Dr. Ravesh Rodin, Head Business Development and Special Projects at ER Consulting. And uh, last but not least, we have Jobert, Systems Integration IT Systems. Challenges for uh, an IT leader. Maybe I can just uh, start with something uh, quite uh, that will give us an icebreaker to start off with. Recently attended a, a diabetes product launch. Not many products, uh, competing products. And uh, we had uh, doctor professionals filling out the room, and that's what we were expecting. And we started to see the demographic changes less doctors, but more people from a different LSM. Um, and uh, we, we got to ask afterwards, you know, why? You know, why didn't the doctors pitch up and why did we have people like from Women's Health and Men's Health and, and, all of, and uh, Vogue magazine? And came to find out that they had found out before we even knew that uh, there's an off-label use for this particular product for, the, for, the, for a particular demographic uh, for weight loss. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, so we just wondered how that, that became, and, and, and I suppose uh, that leads us to why um, some of the challenges that we experience as, as uh, people in IT. And uh, maybe just to start off, we've, we've heard of telemedicine, and we've heard of different product developments, but uh, in the engine room, somebody's going to do the legwork, somebody's going to climb on the bicycle and, and start putting these great ideas together and, and strategically you know, follow a particular strategic path. And uh, that normally happens, that's normally the responsibility of people like me. We, you know, we have the marketing department jumping all over us and saying, ah, we need this and this and, and, all, and all of these uh, particular technologies. Um, but how's it going to actually be developed? And so I want you to, while we go through this particular panel, I want to kind of put it in a way that we can walk a path together and hopefully everybody else in the audience can understand it from that particular point of view. If I fail at that, you can vote me off the island. So let's uh, let's jump into it. So um, basically, one of the concepts that have come up today is the electronic health record, and um, that almost is 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 kind of seen in the industry as, as the start of where everything happens. And as we move from the electronic patient record, we move into um, who can have access to it, how much qualitative data so are we going to allow to be part of that, that record. So maybe just to jump off, um, let's go around and let's have everybody introduce themselves and, and um, where they are and, and a little bit of background. And with that backdrop, let's let's give each uh, each of us a chance to introduce ourselves. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's a privilege to be here. Uh, Johanny Baer, sales manager for T-System South Africa. Um, just as a disclaimer, I wasn't always in sales. I was also responsible for execution before that. I am uh, Dr. Ravesh Gurdin. I'm with ER Consulting. Uh, I've got a medical background together with consulting and insurance medicine. And uh, we're looking forward to the discussion today. Uh, I'm Peter Mills. Uh, as you want to uh, I wasn't always in sales, also in the execution, but also not in strategy. Um, I uh, participated a lot with the late Dr. Kortu in the uh, electronic health care uh, uh, EHR policy, of course, South African National Department of Health. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> just, just recently. Okay, so go back to the patient record. Um, maybe we can just open that up. How important is that? patient record and where do we get it from? How do we get a qualitative uh, uh, 
repository of uh, the electronic health record. Maybe we can start with yourself. Yeah, <laughs> I think sort of um, probably before kind of you know sort of attempt to answer the question, uh, it might be appropriate to ask the audience just by raising their hands. Um, how many of you guys actually um, sort of do banking um, that's pretty much conventional in terms of attending or visiting their branch and using a checkbook? You just raise your hands. So how many of you guys actually go to a bank and use a checkbook? Nobody? Okay. So ironically, we still call it a check account. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then, sort of, my second question to that is, how many of you guys go to a doctor and actually still uses a written sort of pad and writes his notes? Can you raise your hand? Okay. Super. So I think, I think that's pretty much sets the sort of stage in terms of where we're at and in terms of embracing the technology. Um, you know, sort of, is there an absolute need for an electronic medical record? I mean, it's, it's beyond sort of doubt. I mean, the reason we're here today is that, you know, sort of technology has moved on, but in terms of our electronic platforms, in terms of healthcare, we haven't sort of kept up to speed, and it's it's very disappointing to kind of in this day and age to, to to sort of sit here and have this type of discussion. The reason being is that the the value of electronic medical records speaks to kind of big data, and big data drives things like evidence-based medicine. So if we have to look at evidence-based medicine, I think it was probably in the previous conversations and previous panels in terms of uh, standards and sort of, you know, principles and protocols around clinical management, um, which speaks to clinical governance. And I think that's important in terms of, you know, driving sort of evidence-based medicine towards costs, towards, and it speaks to a myriad of things. So, so in terms of its value, it's, it, it's really, it speaks for itself. Right. So, we have two system integrators here. So, Anton, from, from your perspective, you work uh, with a lot of these types of data sets. And uh, putting these type of data sets, where would, where would we get those type of data sets <coughs> to find a qualitative data set for patient records, for instance? I, I think there, there's a lot of silos of information around, you've got the medical schemes having information, um, the, the laboratories, um, the pharmacies, like I previously said. So I think the data is there. The, um, uh, the, the problem comes actually is, is how do you get these different organizations to start um, speaking with each other? And so it's, it's actually much more of a political question than an um, IT question. Now. Because if the political will is there to start sharing databases, um, the, the integration can be done. And that's unfortunately the problem that we see in South Africa. If you think that we are having 20 administrators, um, that's administrating 80 odd medical schemes. So the, those administrators wants to have some kind of competitive advantage, so that when they get sign up a new scheme, they can say, "Well, look, this is what I've got. You know, I've got this health record. We're integrating with this pathology group, and um, we can give you that information." But they would not necessarily want to, to share that with another administrator. So um, that is the biggest challenge that, that we had um, from, um, you know, in, in, in the time that we started Connected Care, is so how do you get um, the big businesses to, to, to see the value of sharing information. I think that the other problem that we have with, um, with electronic health records, and, and I mean, that the banking industry is, is, a, is a good example of how um, information was decentralized, you know, in, in media, initially you went into the bank, then the first step was the auto bank just outside it, and then we came the, the internet banking, you know, so you had to go less and less. Um, the, the fundamental, if we say the fundamental is the electronic health record, the, the, the thing is just um, that it doesn't make for that doctor at that stage or that user, it doesn't give such a big advantage. Like you say, it's actually for population health and it's looking after a lot of um, persons. So the big problem is that when they develop electronic health records, it's always developed with a business um, motive from the company that's developing it, uh, like I say, like a medical scheme. 
and, and then the user will be the, the nurse or, or the doctor. And it didn't take into account their workflow and will make it um, easy for them. So that, that's on a smaller scale, um, the, the challenge, but I think that's also where we need to start with, is, is, is to, to go and understand exactly what's the impact of what has been um, developed. And I, I guess that brings in another, uh, you know, as, as that topic now develops, it brings in another concept which is uh, almost the buzzword that we see in the industry. It's all fine and dandy for the, the, the tech guys to be in the engine room and start wanting to develop solutions, but there's an element that's now creeped in and uh, well, it, 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 has its, it has its pros and its cons. It's the word compliance. And uh, in compliance, you've got a couple of silos inside of there. Peter, if I can maybe direct this question yeah. to yourself. Um, compliance, as far as building this, getting up to, to where we're talking about, hey, you know, we don't want to just be using the technology yeah. just for the sake of technology, but we actually want to see where it's beneficial, and that's the patient at the end of the day. Yeah. How do you see compliance so, in South Africa? So what's quite interesting in, in, in South Africa, a lot of the healthcare practitioners think that they own the clinical record, but actually own it, it's actually owned by the patient and it's all about patient consent. So as long as the patient gives consent for that record to be used, it's quite easy to do it. But just going back to the comment about it being highly political, it's very true that statement, because we know techn technology can cover all the bases. And even the medical schemes that are playing in that role, they will only have a, a partial longitudinal health record. They're never gonna have a cradle to grave, which is exactly what you're looking for. So, for instance, if you look at home affairs, it actually starts there. I mean, today we don't have a primary master index key for each person in the population. You've really got to start there. And like the Department of Western Cape Health has done that very successfully. I think most patients today in the Western Cape have a PMI. So, to me, it's just about consent. You know, as long as the patient gives whoever consent to actually access that clinical record, I think from a compliance point of view, that should be a major problem. We also know that, uh, for instance, in some of our systems, we either cloak or we, we don't show the HIV status of the patient because of the, the civil liabilities risk around that. But you can also, with technologies, um, de uh, encrypt certain fields and things like that from the access control point of view. Perfect. So, you know, um, and you've raised a, another, and we walk to the next uh, avenue, and that's on the encryption side. So security obviously is a big uh, facet been able to, to, once the patient has given consent to be able to have this record out there in the cloud and out there and made, it, made available, where do you see security coming to, into, that, um, into that dynamic? Last, last one to answer, and you're going to get the difficult question. <laughs> so, look, um, I, I, no, firstly, I agree with what everyone is saying. So, um, I, was, I was presenting to a large hospital group Kenya yesterday, this time, and uh, essentially the, the exact same question um, surfaced around cybersecurity and the threat. Um, at the time we were talking about the medical record, which is obviously a smaller subset of data as opposed to the health record, which is cradle to grave. Um, but I think what a lot of people don't necessarily realize when they think about cloud, um, especially private cloud at this stage, is that it's, it's likely more secure than having your own um, data center. Because we take T-Systems as an example, we have 400 security specialists around the world, ex-hackers, um, who simply ex-hackers, that, that whose, whose sole purpose is to try and penetrate the system so that we can close any possible gap. Certainly it's possible to encrypt information, um, and, and even at a lower level, some information is, is available, some is, some is encrypted. And obviously, um, especially if there are regulatory bodies, you can anonymize a lot of the information that enters into the spaces like big data that would, that would allow doctors and, and other caregivers to not necessarily identify the individual per se in certain instances, but to be able to say um, for similar cases, how was it treated? What was the desired outcome? How was it achieved? Um, without exposing the personal information, which obviously um, you know there are consequences to. But um, my my response yesterday was as well. Um, you know, firstly, I, I also started with a question saying, um, you know, how many of us use our mobile devices pervasively? Which leaves the question: Does privacy still exist? I mean, is it not something that we're clinging to, hoping that we actually have? some element of control over our private information. Um, last week at the Frost and Sullivan event in Cape Town, this was a key topic um, to say, if it is 
clearly to the benefit of the patient. And that patient has given consent um, for under the right circumstances and the use of the information for its intended purpose. If I'm in a vehicle accident, do I at that stage really care about who has access to my private information if it's a life-threatening situation? Or am I happy to expose whatever information I have to, to whomever, so that we can um, alleviate the situation? So I think we, we, we really need to wrap our minds around um, the thought of is privacy, does it actually still exist? Um, in spite of our best efforts and, and endeavors to keep our lives private. Um, but around um, security and encryption, certainly there are tools, much like it's technically possible to integrate all of this information, to make that information less accessible um, to individuals that shouldn't have access to it. So I think, you know, what we've, what we've started to see in Baltia, yeah, the building blocks of where we get in concepts like the Internet of Things, where we've got devices everywhere uh, broadcasting information and taking in information. We have uh, data centers being pulled together and collecting information from disparate sources. And uh, that is going to be put together in an intelligible way for the benefit of uh, the industry at large. What are some of those benefits that you see coming out of uh, those type of uh, developments? Um, yeah, I think sort of just before I kind of maybe also answer that question is to go back into the security. It's amazing how we kind of, we trust our bank account, I'm not shooting down the sort of financial sector, but just in terms of how well they've done things, is that we confident that our bank accounts are secure, okay, but we, we kind of less confident about whether our cholesterol numbers are kind of less secure. So I mean, it's just something to sort of ponder around. Okay. Um, in terms of um, you know the sort of development, etc. I think I think the point is that technology does exist. It's the use of it and the user. So you know, in terms of driving the change, um, you know, it really needs to it, it really needs to work. I think it's been mentioned many a time here, it's the collaboration. I think really the collaboration in terms of industries between sort of user, the tech company, the sort of provider, etc., needs to kind of be more synergistic in terms of the collaboration and the outcome and the objective. I think really that would potentially drive change. And I, I cannot agree with you more in terms of saying that, yes, it's highly politically driven. Um, you know, so so I think you know those are the potential challenges that we face. But really, in terms of, we need to start with step one, and what is step one, um, and and we really need to get going. Yeah, and uh, I, I, yeah, I, I mean I agree with that wholeheartedly, and, and I think uh, in us, you know, being the engine room and trying to provide this layer. All of these things start to weave together into a tapestry that allows the innovators to play on a stage where they can take these disparate sets and start providing something useful and solving a particular challenge in, in the whole <coughs> industry. And maybe just uh, as, a, as, as another audience participation, how many of us uh, have today some wearable tech as far as your health is concerned? And where you are collecting things about maybe your fitness, maybe about your, your blood pressure. Can, can we have a show of hands? Okay, so it gives us a good idea. There's a recent study that was just uh, that came to light that about 44% of millennials are wanting and are quite comfortable of using those collection points of their fitness health. They want that information to be exposed to their medical practitioner. Now, why do you think that is? Well, what I must say, I mean, that, that is the, the, the next wave of communication, and that's why, why my colleagues will, will need to wake up. You know, I think if you just go and look at what's happening to the general practitioner, he, he did um, lost actually his role because um, patients these days go quickly to the pharmacy for self-medication, then they Google and they do herbal things, and if all else fails, they go to the specialist. Um, and then, it's only then that they come back to the practice.
practitioner. So, so what is the role for, of, of the GP? And I think as we saw, um, uh, uh, you know, mobile started with voice, and then we had the social networks. Um, the next big thing is going to be health networks. Um, a good example is Strava. Um, I don't know if you're familiar, but I mean, there you can, um, it's cyclists and, and, and people, um, runners, where they post their information so you can actually start competing um, on a certain hill at, at the fastest stage <coughs> or whatever. But um, the engagement will, will um, indefinitely come with the doctor. Because what does this mean? What does my, my heart rate mean from my, from my Fitbit? And um, uh, I think the challenge will be to start the, or to develop interfaces that can actually let the doctor have a meaningful discussion um, about that information. Because again, that, that provider will not, or the doctor will not be able to go and learn all this different, take that data and um, go through it and give meaningful um, advice. But um, also, if, if one starts developing um, systems that communicate back um, to these health networks, um, then, then you can start a, a discussion with one provider, um, speaking to many different, um, different patients, um, and you know, being much more preventative than, than we've been um, starting to change the system. But a lot of work that needs to be done in that space, definitely. And I think uh, probably leads to, to Another thing, another challenge that, that, that uh, the backroom is, is challenged with is, uh, is these disruptive, uh, which we call, in my term, I, I call them opportunities. A lot of people call them, uh, they can be both positive and negative. What are some of those disruptive technologies, Peter? So, I mean, <coughs> sorry, what's <coughs> my So, I mean, we've seen a lot of machine to machine data coming to play. So the monitoring of patients, taking that information into the cloud, doing predictive analytics. Also, in things like high risk pregnancies, comparing one patient's treatment against another one. And then, also in the genomic side, you'll see some emergence of technologies around the DNA profile of the patient and the optimal care for that patient, especially in the oncology area. <coughs> I think, um, it, I mean, in, in those respects, there's probably a lot that's still going to happen, um, and it will become, as you said, a, a bit more pervasive. But uh, in light of uh, in light of these new technologies that are coming forth, where do you see T systems fitting into that into that fabric? difficult to answer. So maybe I can just backtrack momentarily. Um, I am, after all, you've, you've been doing this very well, by the way. Um, usually sales guys on here, you're guys that first respond with questions, but he's just been doing that very well. Um, I think one has to understand what the desired outcome is, right? Because how, how T-Systems and other system um, integrators and technology companies are supposed to um, respond to um, the emergence of new technologies and, and in some instances it's not so much the emergence of new technologies as it is applying our minds towards the use cases of connecting existing technologies to um, converge into a new solution um, because I mean, as, as we stand here um, and that was part of the, the conversation last week at Frost and Sullivan as well is to say without having to come up with something new how do we just take siloed technologies that have specific use cases today and evaluate what is the outcome that we want from that and see how we can combine these technologies to achieve new outcomes and, and you know to a large degree I think that is really the driver um, you know I was on a uh, on, on the plane to Kenya I sat next to a, a lady and she she um, also happens to be in the healthcare space and she used a sentence to say um, nothing for me without me so it's like in patient inclusive treatment yeah and if we if we really change and, and I think Peter mentioned this earlier as well um, our mindset from simply saying as as a, a large stakeholder audience medical aids um, physicians um, hospitals and so forth if we come together and say what is it that we're ultimately driving is it the monetization of each of our own specific interests or are we really acting in the interest of the patient who should be at the center of, of this entire conversation? Then, um, you know, that is certainly the approach that we are trying to take from a T-Systems perspective to say, it's less about what we are able to do and more about what is expected in the market as the outcome. Um, 
So I think there's a myriad of, of those conversations. Um, uh, the, the things like, in, in, in telemedicine was discussed this morning, but um, the anonymization of certain data, um, and this moves into the big data space as well, is to say, how can I um, design my, it's called a clinical pathway, as a, as a, you know, just as a general term that most, pe most people would understand, for a specific patient that has a lot of similarities with other cases, <coughs> and determine that in 70% of the cases, if this is the treatment plan that I followed, the health outcome was achieved in a shorter space of time, at a lower cost, and at a higher quality. Because ironically, cost and quality are not, as a lot of people um, imagine, uh, perpendicular to each other. So it's really about those convergence of technologies that put the patient first. Yeah, just to kind of uh, bring this closer to, to the to what's happening out there in terms of consumer behavior. Um, if you're looking at point of care testing, so we worked on projects with point of care, um, also together with Elliot on the telemedicine sort of projects. Um, it's, it's really consumer driven. And, and we talk about connected point of care. So yet again, to sort of get the audience involved, um, it's, it's, you know, in, in today's <laughs> in, today's, in today's sort of world, we, we look at everybody wants to take ownership of their results and win their test. So everybody wants to know what is their kind of cholesterol, how do I take ownership of my lifestyle, and it's really lifestyle driven. And if you look at that, why do I need to see a doctor or you know have a test done, sent to the lab? have the results sent to me a week later. So if you look at point of care testing, it's real time, it's consumer driven, I don't need a doctor in the play. Uh, you know, so it's, it's really taking ownership of that. But I think the next step to it is around connected point of care, where we basically, where, it, where you can send it through a push sort of platform to your doctor as an example, if there's a problem. So, so really in terms of the kind of technologies and the advances that's taking place, I think that's quite disruptive. Um, also, if you're looking at the principles of the World Economic Forum, uh, it's, it's really the three major principles. Is the first one is embracing technology. The second one is around change in behavior. And the third one is around the change in process. And, and really, in terms of the minor criteria, it's around how do you sort of, it, which is important in, and in terms of the sustainability of healthcare as well as in terms of leapfrogging, in terms of scalability. Yeah, and I mean, you can innovate in any one of those three, you know, and uh, I, I attended, uh, just as, as we start closing this topic out, um, years ago I attended a, a conference and uh, we were listening to Wolfgang Grucker, and he was giving a scenario of where he was packing his bag and he was off to a conference in, in, in Sweden, and uh, his daughter walks into the room and says, uh, Dad, where are you going? He's like, uh, no, I'm, I'm, I've got to rush, I've got to catch an airplane. And I'm out of here. And she says, she quickly turns around and she runs out the room. She says, OK, I'm going to go fetch my bag. And I guess when we talk about the patients of the future, that's kind of the mentality that we're dealing with. And then the role of the IT leader is, is, is grounded, uh, where we've got to keep our eye on the future. Uh, because those are the people, exactly as you've said, um, those, are the, those are the patients of the future and they want accessibility now. They don't want to see restrictions. Um, they don't want, if, if it's information, ask for it, you'll get it. That's about the now generation. So maybe um, we could throw it out to the audience, maybe if there are any questions to close this topic out. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, anybody out there that wishes to pose a question? Thank you. Um, an analogy was made in terms of bank accounts and how many of us go into the bank. Um, I think uh, Dr. Prislow will know that uh, we, the healthcare professionals, have the Health Professionals Council in Pretoria. But the banking industry has got the, the, the council for banks, and that's why we trust them. Isn't it time that we should have a body that will regulate all the participants in electronic health records, um, any developer, where would we be able to ensure that whoever becomes a participant or whoever becomes a client knows that this security, this 
system is good? Is it not time for us to start forming or going down that, uh, that route? Before I, I hand this over to, to Peter, you know, uh, last year we were, uh, we were part of this, there was a discussion that happened, we had some government officials in the audience as well. And um, the, I'm happy to say that we, that topic that we had last year was talking about that specifically, the electronic health record, and um, mm -hmm. where we could centralize it. And you know, the initiatives, why hasn't the government basically got anything together? And basically we got a bit of an insight from, from them they presented to us um, in later forums that led from, from last year's uh, innovation sessions. Uh, where they showed us the architecture of putting it together. I'm happy to report um, that we've, we've moved on. The government has actually listened, and, and um, I think it's around the corner that we actually will have uh, it going live, where we will be start having um, the electronic health record, which I think, in, in my opinion, uh, should start with the government, because essentially they, they, they're the ones that take our tax money. And uh, at the end of the day, they're the ones administrating to the, to the public first of the healthcare initiatives to, to um, most of the population in this country. But Peter, your take? Yeah, so I mean, we know the interoperability standards are defined quite well, um, and also internationally they hold connector forms where they, uh, different vendors with different electronic health records come together and they test all the technology together. So the issue is not the technical side. There's also a pragmatic view you must take, is that not one vendor is going to own the electronic health record. So you're going to have maybe, per, you know, one province will run one technology and another province will run another technology, but, you know, you're talking about HL7, IHE standards, which discharge profiles and things like that. So they all talk to each other, but I think it's a very valid statement at the end of the day that it is overdoing South Africa to say, how do we bring all those stakeholders into place to create that cradle to grave and not just a partial longitudinal health record? Especially around things like allergies when people are admitted to accident and emergency and they're unconscious. Those are life-threatening things that you need to be able to get out of an electronic health record pretty quickly when, when those incidents happen. So I do think it is overdue. Maybe just off the cuff, a, a, a random idea as I was sitting here. Like um, in the automotive space, there are certain incentives to automotive OEMs um, and tax rebates associated with certain behaviours. Not to go into that, because that's, this is not that industry. But um, just food for thought, uh, maybe from, a, from the regulatory body that, uh, that the concept is being introduced, maybe um, creating an equivalent model that speaks to the stakeholder um, KPIs to say that there are certain tax rebates and so forth to participate as an incentive into an, a, a model that, um, that ensures future electronic health record so that there is, um, you know, the private entities that are driven by capitalist um, function, so to speak. Um, public health, obviously, they have different um, drivers, but maybe there's an incentive that speaks to the reality of those entities um, in RAND and, and centers that, uh, that inspire them to participate in such a facility. Just a food for thought. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just to crown what uh, question you raised. Uh, the issue of data. I think we need to know who owns the data. Because there are so many um, healthcare data out there that are lying around. And um, just like um, you say, private cloud is out there. And at the point, we're moving from private cloud to public cloud. And I think it's high point. We need to know what policy really guides the use of the data. And I think uh, at that point, we will know uh, what are we really using the data for? Is it for effective healthcare delivery? Is it for financial purposes? I mean, we need to know that. Because like my experience in the United Kingdom, there is a policy for the use of your data the Data Act. I still struggle to know what the Data Act in South Africa is. Thank you. Okay. It's a very good question. I mean, uh, here in South Africa, the legislation is about to, to mature where they will actually start with just as one, um, just 
one casing point, the Poppy Act will go live. There will be an ombudsman that will be appointed, uh, a regulator, and uh, I think South Africa, we do lag behind, and um, as far as that is concerned, but I think once it's got traction, I think then the, it's, shown, it's shown by the government that there is actually the will to actually treat it as serious. So maybe just to develop it a little bit further, um, uh, I think maybe I can ask a question to the audience. How many of you have a Gmail account? <laughs> okay, so I think I have a, a record here, if, if I may. How are we doing for time? Three minutes. If I could just read you something here. Uh, so, how many of you, and let's, let's be honest here for a second, okay? I'm just gonna read out of the, the, the public contract that you sign when you sign up for a Gmail account. And I'm just gonna read a couple of lines. When you upload, and this is from when you sign up for your Gmail account, when you upload or otherwise submit content to your services, you give Google and those we work with a worldwide license to use, host, store, reproduce, <coughs> modify, create derivative works such as those resulting from translations, adaptations, and other changes we make so that, we, that your content works better <coughs> with our services communicate, publish, publicly perform, publicly display, and distribute such content. Is there a doctor in the house? I just saw <laughs> some people. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, the brevity of that situation, the brevity of what you're talking about, cannot be understated, I think. And I, I think for those people that have a, legis a, a legal background, they, they probably have, there'd be more weight in, in the way that they understand that. But essentially, who owns it? at a very fundamental level to the patient. And I don't think it should be taken away from that right should be taken away. So maybe from uh, your perspective, do you see it the same way? Absolutely, I think uh, firstly, just in terms of the regulation, there's, there's no sort of uh, dispute in terms of who owns the kind of medical record. So the, the medical information is owned by the patient. And so if it's sort of consumer driven, uh, the liability lies onto the practitioner in terms of the hosting and the protection of that information. So, I think, yeah. So I think, uh, just in closing, I think what we need to be really, really careful about in, in, and is that there's a generation that are going to come out, they're going to be happy to share the information, uh, but uh, it's the way that it's going to be shared and who it's going to be shared with. And I think. Maybe just for the last question. Hi, sorry. Um, I might be a wet blanket on this one. Um, but I just want to be careful that we're not drinking our own lemonade um, with um, technology adoption, etc. Because we in IT tend to always focus on the technology is great, we need to get it in, these political obstacles are not being made in, organizational political obstacles may be in some instances. But the evidence doesn't necessarily actually point to that benefits. So the EMR and the EHR, for instance, in the States, it took them about 10 years before they got to a substantial amount of adoption um, that actually would lead them to actually derive some benefit from them. The level of investment by them was ridiculous. Um, so and that's only after there was the meaningful act. So in terms of the actual technology and saying there's a technical capability to have it in, and the actual usage of the technology to a point where it actually derives value for the purpose that we're going for, it's always a distinction. So my question is really, what's the role of the IT leader in managing those expectations? Because you go to the board and you say, we want money to introduce this for this purpose. Uh, we're going to work with ex-partners and other maybe competitors in the industry. But what is, your, what is your role in managing that perception around, actually, we're looking at value in about 15 years? Um, because that's the reality of it. So, okay. so um, it's, a, it's, a very valid, it's a very good question. First of all, um, let me maybe answer it using some healthcare terms. So our company battles with um, trying to get products 
um, they got developed internationally into market in South Africa in less than 10 years. By the time it's cleared and it's been, in, it's been matured through other markets, it only enters into the market here in South Africa. Now, with the same analogy, it's, it's almost the same thing. Us as, and I speak for myself as, as, uh, as an information officer in my company, is if I want to get real value, um, I need to engage with a lot more people. I cannot think that I'm going to do this alone. I'm not the purveyor of the information, and I, it, it would almost be nonsensical for me to think that I have all the answers. I definitely don't. So the more qualitative, meaning the more inputs I take in, in building, let's just call it a business case, real inputs from people that are prepared to put money where their mouth is, where we change it where IT becomes the sponsor, but we change it where the business becomes the sponsor of that initiative. And then it becomes a lot, it's, it's, it's a lot more serious in the game that we start playing. So maybe I can put that over to yourself as an innovator in your area. <coughs> How do you see, see that uh, the role of the IT leader in, in developing sustainability and the right thing for, for a protracted period? I think I, I just touched on it earlier. I mean, I think that the important thing Maybe the same that you said is that um, you can't just develop it for yourself. You you, you need to go out and develop it um, for the user as well. And um, there should be um, if there's not value for, for for the user, you're not going to get the value for what you've spent the money on. So it is about the communication, um, and I think that's the only way that that, that we will be able to uh, uh, get adoption and down the line. And I think the other thing is also um, it is going to you, you had you do have to have that, that five to ten year vision when you start. Um, I was actually it was a great stat to say that mobile health is only eight years um, old. So um, I think at least we eight years in it. And I think a lot um, we, we are going to um, see a lot more adoption um, sooner. But um, it, it is going to be a long process, and I think one must just speak with with people that needs to use it also. Great. That's it. That's a wrap. Thanks for the panelists. Jeff, if you give me a round of applause.